everyone. My name is Michelle Bazargan. I'm excited to be here uh, to kick off 2021. Um, I am currently at Gartner, helping clients uh, prepare for the future, think about the future, be more innovative, think about the workforce strategy. I also have a company called Align Innovations, and I'm very passionate about diversity and inclusion, the actionable way. So I do a lot of speaking engagements, consulting, um, around that and also help a lot of startups as well. Well, super exciting, Michelle. Thanks for joining us on the Abby Podcast to kick off the 2021 on the right note. Uh, very excited to host you and talk a little bit more about all things diversity, inclusion, a lot, you know, the workforce innovation, a lot of that great stuff, very prevalent and relevant topics to, you know, especially the current times. Absolutely. Uh, tell us a little bit more about your background, where you come from, your career path, and then I'd love to spend a couple of minutes talking about, you know, your current project. For sure, yes. Um, so I actually have a, a really diverse and different background, and um, I try to keep it front and center because it keeps me humble. And my family does it if I don't. So um, I'm a very proud Iranian American. My family and I actually immigrated here from Tehran, Iran. We, as a little girl, I escaped a war um, crazy in the middle of a winter storm. We were on a bus. We got smuggled out of the country, machine guns pointed to our faces. So um, the game of survival and being resilient became very clear to me as a child. Um, and just like many other immigrants from a lot of different countries that have all come here to the U.S., you know, we didn't speak the English very well. We had very little money. Um, it was the point where we would put food back in the grocery line. Um, we also were severely judged because of our names, our accents. And, um, you know, people lose sight that we're all from somewhere, right? No one, everyone is an immigrant. If you do a Ancestor.com DNA test, you'll see that you are from somewhere. So people lose sight of that. Um, as a child, I found people went heavily into the media um, and believed what the media said. There was a Iranian and US um, hostage crisis. And so we had to actually change our identity as Iranians because if we went anywhere, we were called terrorists and names and all kinds of other things. Um, it's actually the reason why a lot of Iranian Americans call themselves Persians because a lot of people weren't educated to know that Iran was actually of Persian descent. It went as far as me. Um, I actually, a lot of people don't know this. <laughs> My uh, first name is actually Mernoush, Michelle Bazargan. And what happened is my family gave us American middle names because when we immigrated here, we knew um, that we would struggle. And so I had to actually flip my name around. So my name is actually Michelle Marnoush Bazargan because we couldn't fit in. And I went into linguistics classes actually to get rid of my accent. That's the only reason I don't have an accent. And so I'm bringing all this up because we use this buzzword, <laughs> diversity, equality, inclusion, mm -hmm. and it's real. It's real for me. It's real for every immigrant that's been here, every person that is of a different color, different gender, different race, different sexuality. And so, you know, we, we really need to get serious about um, going beyond the check boxes of hiring more women, hiring more people of color, um, and, and really, really holding ourselves more accountable um, mm -hmm. because it's real and it, it impacts people's, you know, real lives is what I've found for sure. Um, through my journey um, of even how I became, fell into tech is, is actually tied to the story, which is why I start off with it. Yeah. So um, what happened was my dad was very passionate about technology. And so he actually studied computer engineering at University of Miami. We didn't have much money. So he would take me to his engineering classes. I was building computer systems with him, running networks, all kinds of things. And so from there, that actually launched my um, tech career. He uh, have entrepreneurship in my DNA. So we started a company. I've been working since I was probably 15 years old. Originally, it started to make ends meet, and then it turned into my career and my passion. From there, I've worked in major corporations from Toyota uh, Distribution to Ultimate Software to Oracle. Um, I also have spent a ton of time working with startups. Um, I've worked with the Accelerator Founders Institute tremendously. 
And I actually even developed and built and sold a fitness technology uh, solution as well. So I've always gone kind of back and forth between the enterprise and innovation. And it's really neat because you start to very clearly see why startups are more innovative, why corporations and large companies lose that innovative spirit. Um, and so at Gartner, I try to really guide clients on clients like Nike, American Express, FedEx, on how to really be able to do both. Because you need to be able to scale, which is what startups sometimes scale, uh, struggle with, but you also need to be innovative. Like if you don't innovate and you get hung up on the day-to-day, you won't be here long-term. Right. So I'm super passionate about that. I do that at Gartner and at Aligned Innovations. I'm a professional speaker and I also do a lot of consulting on diversity and inclusion and helping startup scale as well. Well, that's exciting. And, you know, quite a background. I really appreciate you sharing, you know, the personal story behind this can definitely relate to that on many levels. Uh, being an immigrant myself. So that's, you know, congratulations to you on all of the great successes you've been able to accomplish so far. I'm pretty sure there's just scratching their, you know, the surface from that perspective. Um, you've briefly mentioned a little bit around, you know, uh, from innovation standpoint, it's, you know, it's a passion of mine. A lot of, you know, guests that I host on Ivy Podcast, that's a prevalent topic. We talk a lot about innovation strategies, you know, strategies to build yeah. and foster that culture of innovation, so to say, you know, you also mentioned something around, you know, curiosity uh, from, you know, as that being, you know, creativity, being part of that, you know, innov innovation concept. Tell yeah. us a little bit more kind of your, your take on that. What are some of the strategies that, really help you when you partner with your clients or whether you're working at your current organization to, you know, not only to, to kind of speak, you know, talk about the overall concept of innovation, but something tangible as far as really fostering that, you know, culture of, you know, experimentation, innovation standpoint. Absolutely. And John, as an immigrant, you'll, you know, appreciate that that curiosity is probably still even in your DNA because a lot of innovation is driven from scarcity. Um, and there's so many examples of that. And so, um, you know, when you look at the last financial downturn is where the Ubers and the Airbnbs and the Groupons came to life, mainly uh, because they saw a need, they saw a scarcity, they saw people were struggling financially and they saw, and they thought through, well, how can we, um, you know, take advantage of this opportunity, right? They didn't sit there and, and cry that, you know, there's a financial downturn. They said, awesome, this is an opportunity. What do we do? And so, you know, they created Uber where people could share vehicles. That was actually driven because of a financial uh, limitation for people sharing homes, Airbnb, um, you know, who, who would think that you would sleep at a stranger's house, right? So um, scarcity is definitely a driver um, starting first, I think, you know, there's this, always this chicken and the egg. Is it culture or is it leadership? Where does innovation start? Um, and I would say, you know, the conversation usually starts with culture, but I actually would say that it starts with leadership, um, mainly because I believe that both in personal life and in professional life and in business, everything starts with yourself. Um, so I like to challenge uh, clients and even my, my, my own, you know, personality and my personal life to really think about, you know, what is your purpose? Why do you do, you know, what you do? Um, our jobs as leaders, and we're all leaders, we're all either leaders at home, on the soccer field, uh, whatever we do, we are all leaders to some capacity. Um, and, you know, day to day from a corporate perspective, let's just say, or startups at scale, a leader's job isn't performance reviews. It's not quarterly business updates. It's not managing KPIs. Leadership, which is leadership for the future to drive both, you know, innovation, curiosity, is to inspire people and the organization to go through places that they never thought was possible. And when you look at the greats, you know, like the Steve Jobs of the world or the, you know, the recent Elon Musk of the world, um, the Jeff Bezos, that's what they do. Um, you know, it's table stakes to do performance reviews and meetings and, and PowerPoints and things like that. Um, so really, I think first it starts with every leader or really every person. It doesn't even matter if you just graduated college. Like, why do you do what you do? What drives you? 
and this principle actually can be used for all areas of life. Like, you know, wh why do you do what you do in your personal life with your relationships? What is your vision and your goal? What do you need to um, really do to, to maintain a legacy? So, you know, on, a per on having these tough conversations with not only yourself or the people around you, um, you know, I challenge both myself, everyone I'm around and every leader to really start thinking about what can they do different to, to set the tone? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can't send conflicting messages like, please be innovative on, you know, Friday afternoons because that's how Google does it. You know, as a leader, you need to understand that your, your company's culture is very different than Google. Um, so that's not very empowering to kind of send that message. It's really to step back and say, you know, bottom up, top down, how do we work together to really bring this to life? Are we giving you guys enough time? Um, are, are, are we talking the, the, are we, you know, just talking or are we being the walk? Are we asking you to be innovative, but then we're asking you to do the day to day and it's not working? Are we saying, um, please be innovative, but then please don't fail, you know, or, or are our behavior showing failure is not accepted? So those are the real challenges. And then as a leadership team, also sitting down and saying, you know, what message as a team are we sending? So a lot of organizations are set up in silos, right? You have the chief information officer, the chief marketing officer, um, all these chiefs, right? But no one's really coming together to say, as a leadership team, what do we do differently? First, us, and to help cause this ripple effect um, in, in, in our culture. And silos are a big challenge. So a lot of people don't realize that our organizations and our organization charts were actually created back in the industrial revolution where all we were trying to do is manage risk and perfect um, you know, output. And so what's interesting is if you pull up one of those org charts from like the 1900s, it actually looks the same, which is kind of scary. So we are, you know, functioning um, the same systems, the same structures, the same silos that were set up to manage risk. They were never set up to drive creativity or, or innovation. Right. And so, and then to top it off, we use a lot of buzzwords, um, yeah. you know, so it just really inhibits it. So we have to rethink the structure one mm -hmm. of our organizations. Um, we have to really challenge ourselves um, from a leadership perspective. We have to throw out everything that we know, because if you think about all the turmoil around us, all the change around us, what worked even two years ago, six months ago, is not going to work now. So getting away from these I know statements, we know statements, and um, really empowering bottom up top down to do it better instead of saying how do we become innovative how do we di drive digital transformation like what does that actually mean for you as an individual and you and and the organization itself right no i i love these examples and you know it definitely makes sense and especially what you you know the overall concept of kind of that servant leadership where you take the org chart almost where you're talking about flipping that upside down and looking at it from that perspective that, hey, you know, with things from leadership perspective, really walking the walk, that in a sense, we're not just saying innovation to just for marketing and the PR standpoint, but it's really yes. to empower and create this autonomy, you know, autonomy, you know, amongst all of the employees or whatever, whatever the organization you're part of, and really view, you know, innovation not so much from that overall innovation standpoint, but it's really opportunities for us to improve, whether that's you know digital transformation, people transformation, and whatever else the case may be. It's really empowering the employees to think outside the box and really figure out ways to, you know, you know, foster that creativity and innovation. So I love those examples. Thank you for yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. And setting the tone for that too. You know, I think the tone is so um, yeah. important. Because if you get, you know, to your point, if you get a ton of inspired people in a room, mm -hmm. but the leaders talking for the first 20 minutes, for example, you're setting the tone. So everyone in that room is going to follow you. So I sometimes tell leaders like, 
high level, say what, where, which direction you're going, inspire people and leave, <laughs> right. you know, hire really amazing, smart, curious people. And, you know, your job becomes a, a lot easier. So great. Point. Right. Absolutely. No, I love that. I love that. And the next question I have for you is something that you briefly touched upon from, you know, the overall diversity and inclusion perspective, more specifically around um, you know, female leadership or, you know, female executives and, you know, especially in technology. Uh, it's a very, you know, it's a highly requested topic on Ivy Podcast from our listeners and so forth. And I know it's an extremely loaded question that I'm about to yeah. ask you that we can probably, <laughs> we should probably spend like a, you know, a series of podcasts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, entire, yeah, dedicate entire vertical to this. Um, and I know it's a challenge for you kind of to summarize these concepts into one, you know, concise response, but still, sure. what is your take on kind of, if you um, were in your early stage stages of your career and knowing not what you know now, um, what recommendations can you provide when it comes to, you know, the work-life balance uh, or, you know, career growth from the female leadership perspective? What yeah. are some of the things that really help you along the way that you kind of, you, you wish that you knew earlier? Uh, so just, you know, just wanted to get your take on that. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Because really the foundation that we lose sight of is people, right? And it's um, females, males, yeah. everyone, anyone with really um, a heartbeat, you know, falls into this category. Um, and before I dive into your question, you know, one of the important things to also kind of on the diversity front, remember, you know, we're obviously in turmoil. There's, there's things going on around us. We're all having some sort of struggle, whether it's family struggle, um, something. We're all connected through struggle. Um, but, you know, we don't speak to each other like that. You know, we use a lot of buzzwords. We don't speak human. We speak very robotic and that ripples into um you know this topic because we have this armor around us or masks you could call it that we all kind of wear based on what's on the outside and so um you know before i get into kind of the the you know specific women uh, question because i actually have a different very different possibly controversial <laughs> um twist to that whole question but um you know, all of us can do better. All of us can, you know, from a human perspective, go beyond like checking these boxes. We can, instead of, you know, society pushes us and all these messages push us to, um, you know, fix all of our strengths and, uh, folk, you know, folk, fix your strengths, uh, go after your weaknesses, do better. And we lose sight that we all have strengths and weaknesses and we can all work to, together. Like, you know, men, female, or people of different backgrounds all have experiences that are unique, that are innate. Right. Um, if you grew up poor, for example, that makes you different. You're probably a little bit more empathetic. Women by natural DNA, um, by God's given nature, which is why we can carry children, are a little bit more empathetic that just is male have that masculine energy and i think we keep going one extreme to the next instead of really just aligning and figuring out what we're good at and what we're not good at and complementing it you're never going to fix every single weakness that you have and so we lose sight of the human piece and we're so focused on what we look like and what genders we have and things like that and so um, for me, one is, first of all, I think we should all do better in this space, um, myself included. I think that we um, really all need to focus more on diversity of thought um, and not what's skin deep, what, not what the color of my skin is, the color of my hair. Um, I certainly have been picked on because I looked different, was different, had an accent when I came here. Um, you know, getting past some of those superficial things that we're really focused on right now and going a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. um, specific career advice that I would give, um, for me, actually, the twist here, the controversial twist is I've actually had more support from male colleagues in my career than I have women. And I've always reflected on why is that? Um, and one of the things is because over the years, and this still exists today, there's limited seats at the table in general. There's limited seats at 
um, a manager's table, director's table, VP, chiefs, whatever you want to name it. And so people become very competitive and the ego kicks in. And so for me, I've always struggled with this topic, to be quite frank. Um, I actually even declined recently <laughs> women's events because I like to fix the challenge. Like, what is the challenge? Are we having real conversations? You know, invite men, invite all humans. Like, let's really have the real deep conversations of why things are not working. Is the corporate structure outdated? Um, what are the root causes? So that's one perspective, I guess, for the audience to, to keep in mind is um, I think the challenges we have keep going from one extreme to the next. And um, just hiring people and putting people at a desk doesn't really solve the deeper problem because are we empowering them? Are we including them? Um, you know, if you're hiring a ton of women, okay, you know, are, are you giving her, or him, you know, leeway, for example, right. or if you're hiring a person of color for diversity and inclusion, are they really empowered to drive this or are we just doing um, a checkbox? So the, the top advice that I would give to segueing into for all humans, I guess, <laughs> because I, I mentor a lot of men in addition to women and people of all different kinds of race and colors and I don't even see color and all those things. Love and um, I think the first one is you need to ask. Mm -hmm. You need to ask for what you want. And whether it's a salary, a title, a promotion, a position. Um, and if you get a no, no is not a never. No is a come back later. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I, ha I had to realize I had this naturally in my DNA because as an immigrant struggling, like we had to do whatever it took. Um, you know, and the other big thing is, you know, don't ask for sponsors, don't ask for mentors, you know, sit down and ask for someone, let's say within or outside of your organization that you really look up to mm -hmm. and, um, you know, ask them to sponsor you, ask them to get real, to help you, to help you navigate, to move through the organization. If you don't ask, very rarely have I seen someone just come and tap you on the shoulder and promote you because of hard work. Right. Hard work is just a piece of it. And I think that's one of the biggest things people miss is um, the world has changed and you're not necessarily gonna be recognized for what you deliver all the time. Um, the other big thing that I find is, and I think this is because of our human wiring of comfort, you have a choice. Like you either have to have courage or you have, you, have, you, you have to be on, you know, or comfort. You cannot have both. You can't stay in an organization um, for 15 years like we used to back in the day and be comfortable and think your career is going to flourish. Those days have changed both ways, both on the employee side and both on the employer side from a overall workforce strategy perspective. The entire workforce has been disrupted. You know, it's not just about remote work and Zoom. It's more than that. So careers are not linear anymore. You have to get, you have to constantly stop and reflect. Am I at the right table? Is my ladder that I'm envisioning leaned even against the right building? Right. <laughs> Should I be switching buildings? You know, basic things like that because time is so limited. And as we all, we're all bound by our calendars. If you don't have a plan and a vision for yourself and you're not constantly measuring it, um, you're going to turn your head and spend time and energy working somewhere and it's not even aligned with where you want to go. Um, so that's really crucial. Uh, what I mean by plan, act, and measure is, you know, you have to take control of your career. You're the CEO of your life, really. Um, you can't rely on a boss to get you the skills you need. Right. You can't rely on a company to send you to the training you need. You need to step back and look at, you know, what would I like to accomplish for my career? And that's different for everyone. Not everyone has aspirations to become, you know, a senior leader in an organization. Um, some people want to become experts at what they're really good at. For example, in technology, maybe going up to an architect position or what have you. So really be conscious of where do you want to go in five years, for example. And then work backwards to that. Like I literally, and I've done this for years, I have a, a spreadsheet with like six tabs and I have like a life plan 
um, for each area of my life, finances, my skills, my, um, I'm, I'm, I'm big into athletics, I'm an athlete, my training plans. And every week I sit down and I check in and say, what am I doing? What worked well? What didn't work well? Um, you know, you have to have a strategy and then you have to have in corporate terms, a way that you're measuring yourself and you're being truthful with yourself. Otherwise relying on a company, um, a boss, a leader to manage your career is really, really risky. It's always been risky, but in today's day and age where everything is changing and nobody knows where we're going to really land for the future, you have to be one, the CEO of your life and two, the CEO of your career. You can't rely on anyone to do that for you. Well, I love these, you know, and you did a really good job summarizing, you know, such a loaded question into kind of these key concepts and recommendations. Really appreciate that. It's, you know, bottom line, taking the full control and really not relying, you know, on somebody else to dictate or, you know, be in charge of your, your career, your life and so forth. And totally. Forming kind of these almost audits on yourself in terms of, you know, my performance, my, my ambitions, my career, uh, and what's the action plan to get there. I think it's super important yet yeah. oftentimes overlooked. So those are great. Definitely appreciate that. Uh, to, to pivot a little bit, want to get your take on, you know, myself being extremely entrepreneurial and, you know, I always, all of the guests that I host on the show, we talk about the different trends. We talk about the different ideas, What's the next big thing? So for Michelle, what is that? What are you currently re researching? What are you, what is your, what is kind of, what, what is the next big, big trend that you are observing that you think is going to be the most impactful? For sure. That's, that's a great question. Um, so by trade, as I alluded to in the, in the beginning of, we started our talk, um, by trade, I'm a technologist, I'm an engineer at heart. So by trade, I gravitate towards all of the technology things that we all hear, right? Uh, cloud, AI, machine learning, predictive analytics, edge computing, internet of behaviors, right? The list goes on and on. Non-technical can be using data to do right time, right place, you know, marketing. But I had to step back over the last five years and go, what's the real foundational trends that are happening? Um, meaning, let's say we perfect machine learning and AI, which in certain roles I have, I've had a lot of innovation roles that I've led, but a lot of it have failed. And so the common theme that I came to was, and I say technology, but this can apply to anything. It can apply to finance. It can apply marketing. Basically, I mean, the technical discipline of your of your trade. Mm -hmm. um, so I came to that, you know, it, this is just a tool. And so the top layers that I'm looking at and finding that impact success and failure of one, not just startups, uh, I'm sorry, not just large enterprise uh, companies, but also startups comes back to the people piece. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think some people realize it, maybe some don't. We're in the middle of a global workforce disruption, upside mm -hmm. down. Um, and certainly, you know, we're all really excited about what technology changes are going to mean to us, but we're always going to have people in the mix. The mm -hmm. first one is skills and education are being turned upside down. Um, the education system has not evolved. I gave the 1900s org chart example the education system is having the same challenge. I speak to also a lot of universities and schools. I work with them to create their innovation curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it, it's just not working, which is why you're seeing companies like Amazon, Tesla, Google, you name it, creating their own little universities, um, their own little boot camps, because they're seeing this gap. The other thing is there's a skills shortage as well happening across the, bo the board. Um, mainly because skills have become so commodity. Um, you know, one great example that I'll reflect on from back in the day, you know, Amazon became really proficient in the cloud space. And so we had a lot of systems engineers that didn't want to accept that systems engineering uh, was becoming commodity. And so, you know, that has happened and that's accelerating even more. So you can't rely any longer on just your technical trait that you went to school for, whether it's you learned finance or you learned marketing, 
um, you really have to step back and look at some of the other soft skills you need as well. And that's where the shortages are with the soft skills. People who are curious, insanely curious, question everything, question what they know, um, extremely collaborative where they have, you know, can't say no ego, we all have ego, have lower ego where they genuinely want to um, work with others. They're comfortable with failure. Um, they have grit. And you can find these types of people in ways that you never thought. So for example, um, I'm an athlete. I'm in a lot of athlete communities. Athletes by nature are comfortable with failure. They have grit. They're super dis self-disciplined. Um, so you don't always have to rely on you know, one area of a person. So getting to know others, but mainly it's to understand that, you know, that is changing. And that's where the shortage actually is coming into play, which is why you, for example, I, I'm sure people will experience this. You can hire the smartest person, let's say an AI, but if they're missing curiosity, they're missing, they're not comfortable with failure. They're not disciplined. They don't have grit. They're oftentimes not successful. That's been my experience. Right, so right. that's why there's such a gap. Um, one, because our companies don't teach that, our schools don't teach that. Um, and so people are losing sight of it and it's the gap is growing. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing too that's happening too is a lot of people are focused on remote work and Zoom and all this stuff. Remote work has fast-tracked the workforce disruption because if you think about it, you don't really have to live in Silicon Valley anymore to work for the tech leaders. If you are in Ohio, Kansas, Argentina, and you have amazing teams and resources, uh, other companies can come now tap into your local resource pool. So the, the level, the playing field has now leveled and where you are located is no longer a problem. So that's gonna even fast track um, the, the whole uh, people aspect and the lines are blurring now with partners um, and uh, vendors and people that are working internally. So the workforce is no longer, I'm gonna hire this permanent employee. It's this blend of people coming together, bringing their unique intelligence to the table to drive the future forward. Um, one of the best examples I can think of um, uh, you know, that, that comes to mind is, uh, a few months ago, Microsoft announced this partnership with Tesla because they are actually disrupting, um, you know, space communication. And so if you look at how they're doing it, they're partnered with these 10 major companies combined with their internal resources, and they're using the um, strength of each organization to bring a solution together. And that's really the future. Um, the future is you know, who's got what piece that they're really good at and how do we bring them together? So if you think about that, which segues into the other big disruption um, that I keep bringing up is our organizational systems, charts, processes, metrics are not set up to support that future. So we have to get really serious about where are we going? What does our workforce strategy look like? How do we really take a blank piece of paper um, and it's not following a best practice, it's you know being creative and innovative, right? right. Um, it, it's to sit down and say, this is where we're going. This is my vision um, for my organization. Okay, how do we get there? Because the ways we've done it before are not gonna work. The org charts from before are not gonna work. The KPIs and measures are not gonna work. The way we recruit is not gonna work. Um, even as deep as the way we lead is no longer gonna work. Um, my command and control style, for example, is not gonna work. It's not a senior leader sitting at the top and saying, please be innovative. That doesn't work anymore. So what leadership changes do we have to make? Um, to, to lump this all in a buzzword, it's, it's called scenario planning and business model innovation. And what that really just means in layman's terms, because I'm all about speaking human, is you know think about the future in a way that's never done before because you're not going to copy someone. Facebook wasn't created by copying somebody. Amazon wasn't created by copying somebody. So really sit down and think about your business. Uh, Shell Corp is a great example. Back in the, the 70s when there was oil embargo uh, challenge going on, 
they were actually the only gas and oil company that made it out of that because they sat down and said, forget everything that's going on, white piece of paper. What are all the scenarios we need to think about and what do we need to do different as an organization to change? Um, if you don't do that, what's gonna happen is you're gonna get what I call blockbuster video syndrome, which is blockbuster video thought that they were the best thing and everybody was constantly gonna take out VHS or DVD tapes. And as we all know, they're not here anymore. So when you kind of think you're the best and these things aren't gonna happen to you or you try to copy um, something that somebody's doing right at this given moment because it works now or they were successful now, well, that's a little naive. So those are kind of the, the big ticket things I'm tracking because, you know, taking it back to how I started the conversation, you could have the best AI, the best marketing strategy in the world. Um, when you don't have this foundation of people, the, a new um, organizational structure that is bringing people together for shared intelligence, including your vendors and partners, um, even how procurement's done differently, right? And you're not being real with the new types of leaders you need. Um, you know, these are the core themes of why a lot of organizations may not be here for the, in the future. And right. if we look at these things, we can be, and we can be prepared, and it can be really exciting. Right. Absolutely. No, that, you know, that's so insightful. Um, definitely. Thanks for, you know, drilling a little bit deeper from, you know, from your perspective. Um, and, you know, for the, for the next part of, you know, our conversation, I want to focus a little bit more on you personally, um, kind of for, you know, with 2020 behind us, you know, still feels like we are in 2020 with everything yeah. that's going on these days that uh, we joke that, you know, it's still 2020. <laughs> it is. Uh, the lines have blurred. I don't even know what, what day is it today? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's December 47th, 2020. Yeah. <laughs> so, so let's treat right. it that way. Right. Um, so, and I'm not a fan of kind of the, the whole concept of New Year's resolutions because, uh, you know, yeah. I have a different take on that. But from your standpoint, I'm curious, what, what's, what's currently, you know, on your, on your short term roadmap for you, for you personally, uh, what are you looking to accomplish? What are you kind of, what are you focusing on through the next short period? Uh, us coming out of this very interesting year with going into hopefully something different. Curious to get your take on that. And how do you prepare for that? Yeah, no, that's, that's an awesome uh, question. Um, so one thing which is kind of tied to my background, um, foundationally, I think we all need to think about changing our story. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, when, when I first, my family and I immigrated here to this country, our story could have very easily been one of, um, why is this happening to me? You know, I don't want to stay here. I want to go back. You know, I can't control any of this because, you know, as I shared my story, a lot of the things I mentioned were a little uncontrollable, but we flipped the story to um, what is the opportunity here and what can I do differently um, and change my mindset to do differently to get out of this. So I think one is that, and I'm challenging myself as well for this, which is obviously you turn on the news and the media and everything is doomsday, right? And also um, as humans, we are naturally wired for um, fear, for wanting to be comfortable. So if you're, you're not constantly challenging your mental state um, which I'm challenging myself to do, you're gonna get dragged down into the sky is falling, the world is falling apart and I have zero control. Um, so th th that's kind of foundationally what I've been working on one in 2020, but now actually leading into the new year as well. Um, so, you know, I have, this, I have this interesting thing that I do and I'll, I'll share it with everyone. Um, I'm sure a lot of people have heard Maslow's hierarchy of needs um, where, you know, it's talked a lot time. about that on episodes last year. <laughs> I was yeah. like, the whole premise was, and sorry to interrupt from a perspective, you know, we're at the bottom level, you know, safety, security, all of that. Yeah. Where we had, how do you still think about innovation, something, you know, higher level. So that was interesting, but yeah, go on. Yeah, no, totally. Because it's true. We lose sight of, you know, we need the basic needs, right? Safety, yeah. uh, food, shelter, um, to ultimately reach what, you know, he had captured um, your full potential or self-actualization. 
So through my journey of life, just experiencing everything I have, and then through my career and family and relationships, I said, you know what, what's my um, hierarchy of mastering myself and my goals? So I literally have drawn this triangle where I said, you know, things are going to happen to you. Like as a human, we're wired a certain way. Our zeros and ones are already programmed a certain way. We're going to want short-term gratification. That's just who we are as a species. Um, we're going to want things immediately. We're, we're not going to want pain. We're going to want pleasure. That's just table stakes. That's how we're, why, why we're wired. Um, that's why when you step back, you see so many people following society, right? Society says, you know, have children, two and a half kids, white, you know, the house, the 401k, um, retire, you know, so we're following systems and processes. So I said, you know what, I have to be real with what, what I want, not what, let's say my family wants, my boss wants, my, all these pressures around us. So I literally sit down and I'm asking myself, and I'm doing this actually right now, <laughs> um, what are my core values and what, why am I doing what I'm doing? Like, what am I chasing? And it's not necessarily a corporate status or, um, you know, the societal things or uh, things in general. Um, um, I actually just sold my house and left Florida. I own nothing, you know? Um, so what motivates me? And really looking at that hard look um, and being true with yourself. And I recommend everyone does this because you'll have a lot of what I call holy moly moments where, I'm trying not to curse, where, <laughs> where you're going, wait, why am I doing this? Is this real? Is this why for me? Or is it because of pressure that's coming from somewhere else? Um, so I really recommend doing that. I call it the hashtag unfollow the herd process, um, you know, and, and being real with yourself. The second is um, really looking at a long-term mindset versus short. And this goes back to what I mentioned about we are naturally wired to do things for immediate gratification. That's why we will go spend $5 at Starbucks for a cup of coffee that's probably 30 cents, right? <laughs> so um, we are wired for short term. And so um, you have to challenge yourself to think long term, which is why I constantly recommend, you know, going to what, what, what you want, why you want it, and then inventorying yourself to say, am I on track? You know, cause otherwise you're naturally going to go to short term. And this applies to self, um, whether it's your financial goals, your fitness and athletic goals, um, relationship goals, even, um, and this applies to business as well, because many businesses right now are worried about their quarterly numbers to Wall Street, and that's it, which is why they struggle with deal, you know, delivering on innovation. They're playing the short-term game, not the long-term game. So personally, I'm challenging myself, what's my, um, what, what am I chasing? You know, where's my mindset at? How do I plan it? Um, act on it. If you don't take massive action, you're not going to go anywhere. You can talk about it, read books till forever, read about social media, but what's my plan? And then I literally map it every day. I literally say, this is what I'm going to do this week. Then at the end of the week, um, I measure myself mm -hmm. and I say, what worked really well? What could I have done better? What fell apart? And then to use our corporate speak, then I literally pivot and say, okay, I'm going to change this this week. Um, and I do that on a frequent basis because life gets in front of you and very time, a lot of times you'll, you know, pivot off track. The other major thing too is really thinking about where is your time, energy, and focus going? Mm -hmm. um, we somehow as humans forget, um, it's going to sound morbid, but we forget there's an end and we forget there's death <laughs> and we run around and we waste so much energy and time. Um, and I've always been baffled on that. And now it's even worse right now. We have social media we're opening. Um, you know, we, we had the news before and now it's everywhere. Um, your iPhone alerts are going off. Your text messages are going off. Like distraction is, is, is crazy, you know? 
Um, and so once again, it goes back to being more conscious of what are you doing? Where are you going? So part of this, um, you know, what I'm sharing with this measure is I literally inventory my time. I inventory how much time I'm spending on social media. I inventory um, the people that are in my life, um, the colleagues that are in my life. Where, where is that time going? Um, and then I kind of carry that over into corporate world a little bit because we do waste a lot of time. Um, and then the other aspect to that that I have found works really well is I put a dollar value on my time. And this doesn't have anything to do with what I make or anything like that. But I literally, I'm like, okay, I picked a number one. So I was like, $150 an hour, okay. Am I gonna check social media if my bill is $150 an hour? Is that really valuable? And the answer might be yes. Or um, am I gonna cl clean my home for three hours if my bill rate is $150 an hour when someone can do it, let's say for 100? Right. Then I actually doubled that rate because I said there's opportunity cost. I don't have infinite time. Right. So if I'm spending time with, let's say, a colleague for two hours, that's two hours I'm also losing out on maybe creating um, a business plan. I don't know. So really inventory your time. And, and this is not coming from a place of knowing. I'm work in progress, but I'm really trying to get better at knowing what I'm going after, knowing my mindset, inventorying it, getting feedback, and then improving. Right. Absolutely. No, I love these frameworks. Uh, and in a sense, it's, you know, one thing that also helps me from a standpoint of, you know, that particular productivity network, I mean, framework is what I call OMA, one major accomplishment is because I've noticed that as I was going through my daily task list at the beginning of the day, I would come back yeah. at the end of the day and I'm like, crap, I didn't accomplish all of that. So I would get disappointed <laughs> because like you said, life gets in the way. And so I kind of changed the mindset. It's not, I didn't come up with that concept, but it's a variation of what I've read and other, you know, successful executives do. It's just really focusing on this one major thing that I want to accomplish today. And yes. I noticed for Putting me that- Putting your focus on it. Yeah, exactly. And if I yeah. accomplish that, you know, I'm happy. Everything else that comes along yeah. with that, I just found you that- find it cool. helps with your mindset too, John? Like you don't feel like, you mm -hmm. feel like, you know, okay, I can do this again versus, oh my God, I can't do this. Yeah. And it was like, oh, I got like 50 tasks on my list. And yeah. Like, like I'm running around like crazy. So that's, yeah. you know, some, some color from my perspective there. Michelle, last but not least, share with us your sources of information. What, what do you what do you read? What do you follow? Uh, what blogs do you subscribe to? If there's sure. a, I don't know, Twitter profile, you you religiously update. Tell us your your content diet that I like to call. Yeah, for sure. So I have so many sources. I'll I'll touch on a couple, um, but before I go into that, I wanted to share kind of one thing I do a little differently. Um, I realized years ago um, that we consume so much information um, and consuming is not doing. <laughs> and this actually ties to your point um, that you made about pick one. Um, so I read a lot of things and I'll, I'll share my hit list here in a minute. But one thing that I would, that I find is working better. And, and again, I'm constantly learning and pivoting is to read something for example if you read a book uh, a chapter um and there was one nugget that you were like wow that that was something that just blew me away mm -hmm. take that one nugget write it wherever you want in your iphone notes journal and do it like implement it try it tweak it um there's a bruce lee quote that you know he takes things from people and what works he keeps and the things he, that don't he lets it go. Um, you know, we, we really, to be effective of all the stuff we're consuming, we, we need to be doing. So that's one uh, takeaway that's actually working really well for me. Um, the second one that I also recently started doing is to challenge your thinking and to challenge um, what you're actually reading. So a lot of us gravitate towards certain topics, certain people. I actually am also challenging myself to listen to people I normally wouldn't, whether it's on a podcast, um, and also to diversify all the topics. So I listen to health and fitness topics, financial topics, business topics, relationship um, topics. And you'll find, which is what I've been finding over the last years, 
everything is so connected. So when you listen to, let's say, a health and fitness podcast, um, there's one I've recently started listening to. It's called Chasing Excellence um, that someone turned me on to, uh, Ben Berg. Bergerson, I'm going to butcher his last name. He's a successful CrossFit coach and one of the top coaches for athletes, mm -hmm. um, uh, for CrossFit athletes. And his concepts totally cross over to not only your personal life, business life, innovation world, relationships. So really challenge what you listen to um, and make sure you're being diverse. Like just because you're passionate about health and fitness, don't listen to just that. Just because you're, um, you know, an executive and you need to stay on top of business, don't make 100% of your what you're consuming just that. But my tops are um, the, the one podcast I mentioned was that. The other one I listened to is one by um, Gwyneth Paltrow. It's called Whoop. That one has just about every topic you can think of. They also make it very controversial to make you think about your thinking. Um, from a business perspective, I listen to uh, Creative Planning, which is by Peter Malouk. He speaks what I call human in the financial markets and, and business. He doesn't use a lot of buzzwords. He keeps it real. Um, Book-wise, I am reading um, Over Principles by Ray Dalio. Um, he is uh, great at not just obviously the financial investment piece that he's so well known for, but also business and life advice. Um, and um, I'm also reading one that is around consciousness. I'm very passionate about conscious leadership, mainly because of what I brought up. I think we need to do leadership differently in business and in life. And um, it's by Dane here. It's called Being You, Changing the World. Um, if you don't read his, if you look up conscious leadership, it'll give you some insights about how to just be more aware, how to question everything, how to do things differently. The other great one is Ego is the Enemy by um, Brian Holiday. Um, and an innovation one that's really awesome is Zero to One. And it really talks okay. about, um, you know, and I've actually read that multiple times about, you know, uh, changing yourself. The other funny one that I'll share and I'll end with um, is I actually um, read and apply a little bit the Five Love Languages books not because it's about, you know, a personal intimate relationship, but, you know, one of the things I find is we all need to do a better job of knowing each other um, and, you know, what we want from each other and what motivates people. And this obviously crosses over to leadership, you know. Um, so, you know, one person may not be motivated by money or gifts or what have you. One might be motivated by time. So that's a really good one that you don't have to look at it from a intimate relationship lens. You can look at it from an overall relationship with people, your team lens. Um, it, it, you know, makes, makes you think a little differently. So that's a funny one I'll, I'll share that I, I'm trying to look at and apply across, across <laughs> all areas. Well, I, I love that. I love those recommendations. And for our listeners, we'll make these, all of these listed in the episode notes so you guys can check them out, subscribe by whatever the case may be. Michelle, can't thank you enough for your time today. It was very insightful, powerful, you know, short conversation. Personally learned quite yeah. a bit. Definitely going to stay in touch. We're going to, we got to do another episode as a follow-up to dive a little bit deeper in some of the things that you were talking about. Sure. So definitely, you know, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah. And I appreciate it. And I think you're doing something that's so important, yeah. which is you're using your voice. Um, and this is going to have a ripple effect. I believe in ripple effects. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that this is amazing what you're doing here on this podcast and the diversity of people that you're bringing on and the questions you're asking. So thank you so much for the opportunity to be here with you today.